Who is China's SpaceX? The answer to this question could be many, as currently six private Chinese aerospace companies are developing reusable rocket technology. Yet it might also be none, as the technological paths and development models of China's private space sector differ from SpaceX's. A more precise question might be, what does a Chinese-style SpaceX look like? But first, let's explore who comes closest to being China's SpaceX. As of October 2025, if we look purely at who has the most mature reusable rocket technology, then Gen Yuan technology is currently the furthest ahead. On May 29th, the company's Yuan Xingzhe 1 test rocket successfully completed its first sea based recovery test at the Oriental Spaceport in Shandong Province. The test successfully executed all phases and finally a soft touchdown on the water. This means the rocket can now go straight up and down like a helicopter, the signature move of SpaceX's Falcon 9. It is important to note, however, that in terms of payload capacity, the Yuan Xingzhe 1 is still a medium lift rocket, lagging significantly behind the heavy lift Falcon 9. Deploying a satellite constellation of the same scale would require many more launches, leading to substantially higher costs. Therefore, from a commercial value perspective, another top student, Landscape's Zhuqie 3, might be a more comparable rival. The Falcon 9 has a payload capacity of 22.8 tons to low Earth orbit in expendable mode. According to Landspace's official website, the Jutra 3 boasts a capacity of 21.3 tons in the same mode, making their design specifications very close. Furthermore, its use of a 9-engine configuration and its design goal of first-stage reusability are highly consistent with the Falcon 9. Thus, for practical application, the Jutra 3 holds more promise for competing with the Falcon 9 on commercial terms. According to the state broadcaster CCTV on October 20th, the Jutra 3 successfully completed a fueling rehearsal and a static fire test, essentially a dress rehearsal before its maiden flight. Its inaugural launch is planned for late 2025. Elon Musk's reaction was telling. Shortly after the static fire test, he posted on X, If they are lucky, they might catch up with the Falcon 9 in five years, by which time SpaceX will be launching Starship. His subtext was clear. By the time you could catch up to my Falcon 9, I'll already be playing with the next level Starship. However, if the maiden flight is successful later this year, the Jutra 3 will have achieved a technological corner-cutting overtake of SpaceX. This is because, while Falcon 9 has demonstrated mature recovery capabilities, its RP-1 kerosene fuel poses a key challenge for reuse, coking. RP-1 tends to leave carbon residues after combustion, which builds up on critical components like the turbo pumps, injectors, and cooling channels. And after each recovery, SpaceX must thoroughly clean and inspect the engines, increasing maintenance costs, extending turnaround times, and limiting launch frequency. In contrast, liquid oxygen methane burns much cleaner, drastically reducing coking and theoretically enabling rapid touch-and-go reusability. This is precisely why SpaceX itself abandoned kerosene for methane in its next-generation Starship. Landspace's Jutra 3 chose this more reuse-friendly path from the very beginning. As early as July 12, 2023, Landspace Jutria 2 Yao 2 rocket successfully launched, becoming the world's first Methalox rocket to deliver payloads to orbit, even before SpaceX's Starship. Therefore, in the engineering application of Methalox rockets, Landspace is already a world leader. So, can we call Landspace China SpaceX? From a business model perspective, this answer is more complicated. Beyond reusable rockets, SpaceX has another critical business, Starlink. The vertical integration of rockets and satellites is central to its model. In China's answer to Starlink, the Qianfan constellation does not belong to land space. It operates within a more complex public-private partnership ecosystem, reflecting a fundamental difference in industrial division of labor between the Chinese and American private space sectors. The Chenfan constellation, also known as G60 Starlink Plan, is a low-orbit communication satellite network led by Shanghai Songjiang District and implemented by Shanghai Yuanxin Satellite Technology Company. This is a typical national team-led, privately participated system engineering project, fundamentally different from SpaceX's model of single private company managing everything. 
It is precisely this model, however, that exposes the limitations of the national team and creates the historic opportunity for private companies like Landspace. According to its deployment plan, the Chenfan constellation's first phase involves launching 648 satellites for regional coverage, the second phase, 1,296 satellites for global coverage, and a third phase will exceed 15,000 satellites, aiming to become the global low-orbit communication network on par with Starlink. The reality is challenging. As of March 2025, the Chenfang constellation has only 90 satellites in orbit. This means that even to meet the Phase 1 target, 550-plus satellites are still missing, requiring at least 30-plus dedicated launches in a short time frame. While Lynch and China's wisdom cautions haste makes waste, why the urgent rush this time? Because this is a race against the clock on an international scale. For low-orbit communication satellites, Orbital slots and communication frequencies are precious, finite resources. The International Telecommunication Union coordinates these based on first-come, first-served principle. Priority goes to the national network that first files, coordinates, and actually launches its satellites. In other words, if the Chenfang constellation fails to deploy on time, the consequence isn't mere project delay. It risks losing these critical orbital and frequency resources to other nations, plunging the entire project into profound uncertainty. So, given its importance and Shanghai government backing, why not rely on national team's long-march rockets? The answer lies in China's objective structural launch capacity gap. This gap stems not from an inability, but from the dual pressures of national strategic demands and commercial market needs converging in volume and timing. China's national team is simultaneously advancing multiple national-level projects critical to long-term development. These missions are not only technically complex, but also hold the highest political and strategic priority, with launch schedules that are long-planned and inflexible. For instance, the Tiangong space station requires regular crewed and cargo missions to sustain astronauts and experiments with potential expansions ahead. The lunar exploration and planetary exploration programs are advancing steadily. Missions from Chang'e 6 to the future lunar research station and the Tianwen series targeting Mars and beyond each require dedicated launch windows on heavy lift rockets. And cutting edge projects like quantum communication satellites, gravity measurement satellites also demand a high reliability assurance of national team rockets. Therefore, it's not the national team doesn't want to help. Faced with this multi-front engagement in human spaceflight, deep space exploration and frontier science, the capacity and launch paths of the Long March series must be prioritized for these long-cycle, high-difficulty national projects. Against this backdrop, the Chenfan constellation's need for high-frequency bulk launches to deploy tens of thousands of satellites simply cannot be fully accommodated within the national team's fixed schedule. Arguing about first-come, first-served as a losing battle, these national projects were planned decades ago. And furthermore, there's this cost issue. The Chenfan constellation is ultimately meant to be a profitable, sustainable commercial venture. National team rockets designed for maximum reliability and redundancy for strategic payloads prioritize performance and safety over the economies of reuse. While the national team is also developing reusable rockets, their technological maturity and commercial applications still need time. If all 15,000 satellites were launched using expendable national team rockets, the launch cost alone could be astronomical. Even if successfully deployed, it would be a spectacular feat, not a truly commercially viable project. Therefore, at this critical juncture where mega constellations like Chenfan urgently need high-frequency, low-cost launches, relying solely on national team rockets create bottlenecks in launch window, frequency, and cost. It is against this precise backdrop that private companies like Landspace have found their irreplaceable mission. They're not competitors to the national team, but an indispensable piece in China's overall space strategy puzzle. Returning to the Jiuquia 3, its payload capacity perfectly fits the needs of massive constellation deployment. Its Methalox reusable technology promises the rapid turnaround crucial for the time-pressed Chenfang constellation. Let's do a quick calculation. Phase 1 requires 648 satellites. In its recovery mode, the Jiuquia 3 can carry about 18 tons. Assuming each Chenfan satellite weighs 300 kg, that's about 60 satellites per launch. 
and theoretically just 10 to 11 successful launches could complete phase one. If the Jupiter 3 achieves its design goal of being reused 10 to 20 times, then just one to two rocket cores could potentially satisfy the entire Phase 1 launch demand. This is the commercial promise Landspace is betting on. Thus, from both technological and business model perspective, Landspace appears to be the strongest candidate for China's SpaceX. However, as analyzed by Wang Xiang, a retired PLA senior colonel and now a distinguished fellow at Fudan University, Judging by business models, founding ethos and historical mission, Landspace might be better termed Chinese-style SpaceX, or perhaps shouldn't be compared to SpaceX at all. The American SpaceX leverages NASA's mature technology to serve its own Starlink. Its corporate story is driven by Musk's personal ambition to colonize Mars. China's Landspace and other private aerospace firms walk a path of complementary collaboration with the national team, providing launch capacity for national satellite constellations in the commercial market. Their mission isn't to reach Mars, but a more pragmatic goal, to swiftly deploy a satellite internet covering Earth, bringing space-based services to more people. It's a story grounded in the present, serving real-world needs. Their most pressing task is to help complete another constellation, ensuring that free competition remains vibrant beyond the common line. Thus, the biggest difference between the US and Chinese private space models is this. One is single company vertically integrating all space businesses. The other involves the national team securing strategic mission while private companies focus on the commercial market with key projects advanced through public-private partnerships, a model for specialization of labor. SpaceX vertical integration enables high iteration efficiency but means putting all eggs in one basket. And China's division of labor model can accommodate more technological paths and allow more teams to contribute, albeit requiring more complex coordination mechanisms. Which model is superior? Analysts of different nationalities, standpoints, and knowledge frameworks will have their own answers, and time will be the ultimate test. But one thing is certain. When a Jutria makes its maiden flight, when the Chenfan constellation gradually takes shape, when the people in the high seas in remote areas have more choices for getting online, we will realize that China's private space industry has already carved its own path, not as a copy of SpaceX, but as an innovative solution adapted to China's context. Perhaps this is the true answer to the question, what is a Chinese-style SpaceX? Thanks for watching this episode of Topics. I'm Chris. If you have any thoughts, please leave a comment and see you next time.